Okay. Um, thanks very much, and um, thanks, Kathy and Tom and Paul Allen, especially, um, for this opportunity. Um, what I want to tell you about is work that uh, my colleague Long Kai and I have been doing together for the last two years. Um, really, um, totally enabled, and in fact, I think probably wouldn't have happened without um, this um, program. So the idea is to start thinking about kind of how we can get to an understanding of kind of what happened to cells in the past. In in developmental systems. And I think the inspiration for this is this basic question we have, which is, um, you know, how does development work? And if you think about it, development is the most amazing uh, program I think you can think about. Um, it's very special in many ways. It, for one thing, um, it's a self-organizing program. These tissues are patterning themselves. It's something that's going on in parallel in many cells at the same time, while those cells are pro proliferating. Um, and it's very spatial, so it takes place not only in time, but also in space. So, the, so this is sort of why it's so amazing. And um, if you think about what we really want to know a lot of times when we think about development, we really want to know kind of how each cell got to where it is. So what is its own unique history? And that means, first of all, when was it born and who is it related to? That's the lineage history. But it also means um, who did it receive signals from? What kinds of external inputs did it receive in the past and when? And it also means kind of what decisions did it make at each point in the past. So if we could understand these basic histories of what cells went through, we would really be able to understand a lot of developmental processes much better. So is there some way in which we can get that information out of cells and ask each cell what happened to you in the past? Um, so in biology, we have a great way of looking at what happened in the past, which we've been doing for a long time. It's called phylogenetic inference. And this is the idea that if we have different marks or mutations, for example, that have occurred over time, we can use those to organize a set of cells measured now and kind of understand uh, the, the, or infer the, the probable uh, historical background, where they came from in terms of uh, lineage. This is done all the time, for example, in evolution. And um, not only in evolution, but um, you know, recently a, a few you know, groups have done really pioneering and beautiful work using somatic mutations to try to reconstruct the lineage histories of individual cells. This is an example from uh, Chris. But um, um, this work is great and really does give us kind of an enormous amount of information about the lineage histories during developmental processes. But it also has some limitations. So first of all, it's hard to find these somatic mutations. They're scattered all over the genome in general. Um, when we use sequencing to identify them, we have to disrupt the tissue. So we use, lose the spatial context of the cells we're looking at. And um, ultimately, we want to we be able to record and read out information that's not just lineage, okay, but other kinds of signals. And so this is the system that Long and I um, and our groups put together. It's called MEMOIR, and that stands for Memory by Engineered Mutagenesis with Optical in Situ Readout. I should say this is a backronym, so we went through a long <laughs> series of other things that MEMOIR stands for, but this is our current uh, acronym. Um, so MEMOIR, we had kind of several design goals that can be categorized into two kind of processes. First is writing. So for writing, we want to be able to record uh, lineage, but also signals and transcriptional events going on inside cells. We want to be flexible. We want to be able to target the writing to define sites in the genome so we can find the information that we wrote. And we want this system to operate autonomously so we don't have to manipulate it. So it can, it can occur inside uh, an embryo, even if it's uh, not directly manipulable. Okay. And of course, the, gr the obvious tool for this is CRISPR, which can write mutations at any site in the genome that we choose. Okay. Now, for readout, we wanted something that would be highly multiplexable, so something where we could look at lots of different pieces of information. We want it to be single cell, and uh, we want it to be able to work in situ without disrupting the spatial organization of an embryo. And for this, um, we turned to the technique that Long Kai invented a few years ago, which is, has various names. One of them is sequential fish or uh, multiplexed, uh, you know, uh, yeah, multiplex single molecule fish, I guess you could call it. And this is a very simple idea that if you have a gene, you can uh, look at the RNA for that gene in a cell with, with um, probes, fluorescently labeled probes. And you can do that once, and of course you can look at individual dots representing individual molecules in each cell, and that's great. But you don't have to stop there. You can remove those probes and then rehybridize against the same target mRNA a second time with another color. And you can again image, and then you can remove those probes and do it again. And so in this way, you can assign a particular co sequential color code to each gene. And so for example, this gene might be red, blue, green, but some other genes might get other 
temporal sequences, like blue, green, orange, or orange, red, orange, or whatever. And the great thing about this is the coding capacity scales r very, very fast. So with just a few colors and a few rounds of hybridization, you can get hundreds or thousands of different genes that you can read out. So this gives us a lot of readout uh, complexity. And I think a great demonstration of this is Long's, uh, a paper that, from Long's lab that just came out in Neuron. And uh, this is imaging of the brain. And um, here you can see, I guess, uh, you know, in the, each of these individual dots is one mRNA. And what you're seeing here is the sequential hybridization of this little box here. And this is in the hippocampus. And you can see that, you know, for example, this molecule, the first round of hybridization was red, then blue. Then uh, actually here it was missing, it is an error, and here it's yellow. So this is one code. There's an error correcting round here also. Here's another one that goes purple, red, blue, blue. Each of these can be identified as a distinct molecule. Okay. And so using this technology, um, Long's group has now you know, been able to look spatially at, uh, first of all, discovering new cell types in the brain and then seeing how they're actually spatially arranged with respect to each other. Okay, so to do a recording system using this technology, we first need to have some kind of way of writing information in the genome. And our basic unit, we call this the barcoded scratch pad. It represents kind of one bit of information storage. And this is a gene, it's a synthetic gene that has two parts. The first part is a repetitive element we call the scratch pad. And the second part is a unique barcode. And when this is expressed, it's expressed into an mRNA. And again, we can probe that mRNA with two sets of probes, one to the scratch pad and one set to the barcode, which is indicated here. Uh, and then we can see, see the state of this, this gene initially just by probing it that way. Now, if we come in with Cas9, targeting Cas9 to that repetitive region, we can make a double strand break and through homologous recombination, we, the scratch pad region, the repeats, will collapse to a much shorter segment with just really usually one repeat. Um, and so this thing will still be read out as an mRNA, but now that mRNA will still have the barcode, but it will lack the scratch pad component. And so you can think of this as the zero and the one state of the bit, these two states of the barcoded scratch pad. Just to show you what this really looks like, if we do this in cells, these are two cells uh, outlined in white, one on the top and one on the bottom. And here we're imaging, these cells contain many of these different barcoded scratch pads. So if you look here in red, um, you can see all those repetitive regions, those scratch pad regions, and then you can see on the right one of the particular barcodes, in this case barcode number two. And so if we highlight the barcodes here in green, we can look at the scratch pad and see whether or not we also see a co-localized dot in the, uh, in the scratch pad channel. Okay, and so what you see here is in the top cell, whenever you see the barcode, you also see in the same place the scratch pad. In the bottom cell, you see the barcode without the scratch pad signal. And so here's another way to look at it, where we've just spatially, uh, horizontally displaced the green and red signals a little bit, and you can see they're overlapping in the top cell, and there's no red scratch pad signal in the bottom cell. So we, here we have two cells that are in two different states for this bit. Okay. Now we can... Actually, we don't have to do this with one. We can make a whole array of these things, each of which has the same scratch pad sequence, but a different uh, unique barcode. Uh, and that gives us a larger addressable memory space. Okay, so now if we want to use a bunch of these to record and, and, re and reconstruct lineage, it's pretty straightforward. We start with a cell line that has many of these elements, and then we'd want to turn on the system and let some of these elements get, get uh, you know, progressively and stochastically and independently cut in different cell lines. So at the end of a few generations, each of these cells will have a unique fingerprint of which bits are, are uh, in which states, and from that we could reconstruct the lineage. And so the idea is we would uh, let this happen, and then at the end point we do this sequential fish, we read out the states of all our scratch pads, and we do the reconstruction. Okay, so we wanted to build a cell line that would actually do this, so we started with mouse embryonic stem cells, and we have a cell line we call MEM01, it's our first memoir cell line. Um, it's this ES4, uh, E14 ES line uh, background. And into this, we put 13 of these scratch pads. So we put them in by piggyback. They're scattered all over the genome in this implementation, although they don't have to be. Um, and then we set up a system where we could express Cas9 under inducible control. So in this case, Cas9 is, uh, has a, a Degron on it that's inducible by a molecule called Shield1, which stabilizes Cas9, so we can induce it that way. And then we also have the uh, guide RNA. In this case, it's co-expressed with a fluorescent protein, m turquoise so we can see how much of the guide RNA we're making. And it's surrounded by ribozymes, which kind of cut it out of the transcript and allow it to work. 
Um, and this, by the way, I should also say is under the control of a wind inducible sensor. So the idea here uh, is two things. First of all, we can use wind as an inducer, but also uh, this is a step toward being able to read out endogenous wind signaling as a kind of biologically relevant readout. Okay. So now, in order for this uh, lineage reconstruction to work, we want the, co the collapse events to occur continuously and progressively and independently over time, and that's true. So this is just to show you that if we look at the fraction of those bits that are co-localized, it decreases with time continuously. Uh oh And it also depends on the expression level of the, um, of the guide, so we can tune it. Okay, so can we re reconstruct lineages? So we, we, do, we did this, we turned on the recording, and then we let the things, these cells grow into colonies, and um, then we, we probe. So we probe for the scratch pad, we probe for one barcode, another barcode. Then we do it again, we probe for the scratch pad, another barcode, another barcode, and so on. We do this seven times to access all of those um, barcodes. And um, then we get images like this. This is actually just a tiny subset because I'm only plotting a few of them here on top of each other. But in principle, we actually have all 13 of these at the same time. And I just want to emphasize that this is 13, but we can access a lot bigger space here. Okay, so let me skip this because time is short. Okay, so, um, so if you do this now for many different colonies, you can make for each colony a table where this is the number of the barcode in the cell. The color here represents the fraction of those scratch pads that have been scratched out. And, um, and from this table, you can then make a kind of distance matrix that tells you for each cell how similar or dissimilar it is really uh, from every other cell in the colony. And from that, you can reconstruct these trees. These, these are the lineage trees. Now, how do I know the trees are right? I know because at the same time we did this experiment, we actually recorded a movie. So using the movie, we have an independent way of following all the cells and knowing what the true lineage is. And so we can compare these reconstructed lineage trees to the real ones. And so we did this for about 108 colonies altogether and, um, and validated them. Okay. I should say this actually, the system scales surprisingly well. So if we wanted to go even to a much deeper tree, like 10 generations, we can do that with you know, only 50 scratch pads or so, which we think is totally feasible. Okay. Now, so far that's just lineage, but I said we also want to read out other kinds of signals. And the beautiful thing about the system is that you can have one guide RNA working with one set of scratch pads to record lineage, but we can in parallel in the same cells have a second set of scratch pads that are uh, scratched by a different gRNA using the same Cas9 that targets this other set of scratch pads. And that can be responsive to any signal, like Wnt or BMP or anything else. And we could do it with a third set and so on. And so if we do this, you can imagine taking cells, cells that are experiencing different s histories of signaling over time, like this cell, it turns on signal one, then this one turns on signal two, but not this one. This one keeps one on, or this one just turns two on and never, and then turns it off here, it doesn't turn it on. Anyway, each cell lineage could have its own history. And so just to see whether the system ought to be able to reconstruct that, we took empirical parameters that we measured from the operation of, the, of this first experimental system and simulated what we would expect to see. This is a sixth generation tree. There's two lineages that are highlighted here in yellow. And so if you see this one, this goes, is activated the green signal and then the purple signal, the correct behavior, anal the analog behavior in terms of the intensity of signaling you expect is that transparent green and transparent uh, purple signal. And you see when we reconstruct these things in the simulations, we get pretty close to what the real signal was. Okay, and we can do that also. Here's another lineage, and you can see you can reconstruct a different temporal sequence of signals. So we think this can give us kind of temporal dynamics, analog dynamics uh, over time in each lineage. Okay. Now, the last thing I should say is that the, the other nice thing here is that this whole system, after we read out the uh, barcodes, we can continue reading out endogenous genes. It's totally compatible with readout of endogenous gene expression. And so if you think about that, being able to get both the lineage and gene expression at the same time can be especially powerful. And just as an illustration of that, I want to show you, this is a, not a memoir experiment, but it just illustrates what you can do with lineage and gene expression together. This is an analysis of uh, mouse embryonic stem cells that switch between uh, multiple distinct states when grown in LIF and serum. And uh, in particular, we identified about five different states that these cells can be in. And we just want to ask, from knowing the lineage and knowing the endpoint gene expression states what we can say about what kinds of transitions occur in this population of cells. In principle, you can imagine any possible transition. Um, 
And, uh, but, but the lineage information really uh, can tell you which ones actually occur. So you could ask yourself, I'm going to give you a multiple choice question here, which, what do you think the, 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 which transitions actually occur between these states? Is it everything? Is it just a ring of transitions? Are there disconnected subsets? Is it a chain of some kind or is it some other geometry? So you can just make your selection at any time. Okay. The, and this is like a set of, in this case we got the lineage from movies, but we have a large set of these colonies, the gene expression patterns, and using a mathematical framework which is described in a paper here, um, we can actually measure what these rates are by inference, and it turns out to be this linear chain, and the chain is organized from the, the most, uh, sorry, from the most naive or most potent state into the uh, kind of most prone or primed state. It's kind of interesting dynamic. Okay, so now just to finish, so, um, so what I showed you on the memoir side is really kind of a proof of principle. It's our first attempt, kind of our 1.0 version. But we think this system can do a lot more. Um, so we have some goals now. One is to kind of, uh, we think we can increase the recording density um, a lot. So we, with a, a improvements to the system, we want to take this into embryos. So the nice thing about being an ES cell is we can immediately go into the mouse embryo and look at things like tumorigenesis and embryo, embryogenesis. Um, and then we also have this other idea, which is that it would be great to create something like a memoir mouse. The memoir mouse would have all the recording components already in there, validated, working great. And this mouse, if we set it up right, could be, for example, activatable by uh, Cree, in which case it could be mated into application-specific mice, which would allow you, uh, you know, anybody to kind of mate their favorite Cree mouse with this mouse and be able to record signals and tissues of interest. Okay, so this is the conclusion here. Uh, memoir is a programmable system that will allow us to kind of read out cells, we like to say, each cell's own little private, not so private anymore, memoir. And this is, um, uh, I, I want to say, this project was so fun because we had this amazing team of people. So the three people who really led this work are Kirsten Frieda, James Linton, and Sahan Hormoz. And um, obviously this whole thing is a, a super fun collaboration with Long Kai. And we also have a, another group that's kind of working on the next generation of this system in parallel. So I just want to say thanks again to uh, Paul Allen, to the foundation, and um, happy to take questions. Questions? If you can gather all the lineage information based on the pattern of the scratch pad, why not just grab all the cells and do single cell RNA seq to get the gene expression data? So that would give you lineage plus all the genes. What's the advantage then of the in situ? So the, what we're trying to do, so the trouble with single cell RNA seq is that we just have to rip apart the tissue. So the idea is doing in, in situ is we can see what the relation, not just the lineage relations, but also the history in the context, in the spatial context of the tissue itself. That's the idea. Which yeah, but with, this, with the scratch pad, you could figure out which cells came from which anyway, and then you would still have the history, the lineage history. You just wouldn't see it. I mean, for, mean yeah. for a culture of ES cells, they all kind of look, similar morphologically, so what do you gain by having the genes by in situ as opposed to? Yeah, I guess what I'd say is the ES cell system is kind of our proof of principle yeah. to see it can work, and what we really want to do is to go into developmental context, right. where, which are very spatial, so that's the idea. Michael, why do you think the linear chain network is utilized by the system? Yeah, it's a great question. So we were kind of surprised by that. Um, because what's really happening is the cells are taking kind of a random walk along that linear chain. And um, what is, so one idea we have is that when you look at, you know, classically in development, we often think of these binary fate decisions, right, just single branch points. And one question is if we were to zoom in on those branch points, would we perhaps see chains like this where cells are kind of moving between virtual states that have uh, you know, different propensities for landing in one or the other branches. And this is something you can start to see this way. Oh, in terms of the depth of the tree? Yeah. Yeah. So in this proof of principle, we did uh, three generation trees that go from one cell to eight cells. But um, one thing we've looked at is theoretically is how the, the system should scale. And so one slide I went through very quickly was that uh, with 50, it depends on the number of scratch pads, 
the how many how much you know information you can store. But with a number like 50 scratch pads, we could we think we could access depths of up to like 10 generations with pretty high accuracy. Now all of this is inference, so it's all a stochastic system, so it's all probabilistic. But we think we get very high accuracy with with a reasonable number. Yeah. 